And we're back again with another episode of Matchup Zone here on the Norse Report. We're joined today by a guy who, I mean, honestly, was he was probably supposed to join us a little earlier in the year, um, but it didn't work out uh, for various for various reasons. Uh, Matt Dudek from the Horizon Roundtable. Matt, Kyle, how are we doing, man? Doing good, doing good. Um, it is Thursday, two days after probably. I don't know. I said this in a tweet the other day, Matt. Tell me if you agree. Um, I don't even remember which tweet it was, but I said it was probably the best individual day of Horizon League basketball since Northern has been in the con- – I can't speak to before Northern, but since Northern's been in the conference, like those four games, being the only four games on the men's side, there wasn't a dud. It was the best collective top-to-bottom day of basketball in the league's history since we've been a part of it. Um, I mean, I can only go back a few years before you even, but um, you don't get five minutes on Sports Center as a league, like unless you're the Big Ten, you know what I mean? Like, or, or some other power power five, like for the Ryzen League to get five minutes of Sports Center time with, with those games and they recapped all four of them. That's that tells you how big that was. Like from a sport, like this is this is March Madness and they they kicked it off. It, they did ESPN a big favor and, and produced some some killer games. I, I came home on uh, Tuesday night from the arena because you know I actually get to go two games as as media because you know school appreciates what we do and yeah, uh, no doubt dude uh, sorry Kyle but uh I got I got home and I had about a 45 minute drive 45 minute drive so by the time I got home it was probably 90 minutes or so after that game had ended and we were you know watching the other games on screens while we could and all that and I was still my my uh, my adrenaline was through the roof just in college basketball and yeah. You know, in a weird year, that was just, that was really nice. It really was. It felt normal. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't watch a lot of sports center anymore, but when I saw people start, like, I think I saw two conf- conflicting posts. One of them was that NKU, um, the NKU game was the lead on sports center. The other one was that the Wright State game was the lead on sports center. But regardless, like, I, my guess is that it was obviously your, the, the full thing is that it was a five minute segment on the Horizon League. And so probably someone saw one clip before the other and someone saw someone came in late and saw the other clip. It doesn't matter. The point is like they covered the the league and Campy talked about it. I actually listened to the Campy show. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He talked about it, how like his phone was blowing up from people, recruits and like people like national people that he knows from coaching and stuff like basically saying, man, like th- that was an awesome day for the league. Like I'm ready to, you know, for the recruits, like I'm ready to play ball and like stuff like that. So, well, and you, like cool. I know you were listening to the Campy show. He talked, um, a lot of people wouldn't believe this or don't know this. Campy, Campy got, has a degree in journalism. That's, and there's been times yeah. at Oakland that he's, uh, he's covered journalism, you know, journalism classes and, and all that. And he said something about he was taught in journalism school, like you don't get a five minute segment on TV unless like Jesus has come or something like that. You no, know, he, he said, he said, uh, he said, he said, uh, Jesus wouldn't even get five minutes on, yeah. on the, on TV. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for the Horizon League to get five minutes on, on you know, leading off Sports Center and all that, and I, I'm not a Sports Center guy anymore. I don't, I don't even have cable, but uh, like that's still that's really cool, and it, it's big for recruiting. It's big for the league. The league, the league put on a put on a hell of a show on Tuesday. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would have been satisfied just with the buzzer. I mean, obviously the NK you get the buzzer beater, but like, even if we, I mean, man, even it's really hard to do this to say this. I you know what I am going to say it, even if it flipped the roles and we had lost on the buzzer beater, I probably still like collectively, I would have been devastated if that was like NKU lost on a buzzer beater and every game was a blowout. But like given the full slate of games we got, even if you would flip the roles and NKU had lost on a buzzer beater, I would be looking at that night as like a positive overall experience as hard as that is to say. Um, and a lot of that is due to Wright State getting their ass kicked. But <laughs> you know, I'm uh, I'm I'm a little familiar with buzzer beaters. I'm sure we'll uh, talk about it at some point. And you know, they they happen. And sometimes all you do is you you smile and you go, "Damn, that was." Yeah, good. well, it's funny because, um, actually, you know what? Let's just use that to segue right into this. Um, I'm looking at this bracket, and obviously, you we couldn't predict this coming into the you know tournament because the bracket recedes. So like you have to run through, what do they call it? Like a permutation where it's like every possible 
uh, just to be able to pick the right games. So like my brackets effed. I had NKU and Oakland playing, but in the championship, that's right. obviously not even possible now. So I had Bright State Mercy, so I look extra dumb. And NKU fans that are probably watching this know how stupid I am when it comes to predictions. So like part right. of the course here. Yeah, well, we do. We'll get to that later too. But um, one thing I'm, I'm noticing is just kind of a small little storyline here that I haven't heard talked about. And I just honestly, it just came to me as we're talking about the buzzer beaters. This is sort of a uh, redemption tour for Oakland in a way. Like this, this tournament shaping out to be like a put your demons back in the closet um, kind of kind of uh, tour because they beat Youngstown State as many NKU fans will remember that game was one of the three most important games for NKU to go to the first NCAA tournament of in their history. Uh, you guys lost to Youngstown state on a, on a botched inbound. Well, not botched for them, but botched defensive inbound for you guys. Um, and uh, I think it was 2016, 17. Yeah. And you were the one seed and we were zero and two against you that year, I believe. Um, or maybe one and one. No. Yeah. I don't know. We were fi- we were uh, one in five against the top three seeds, so we needed all y'all to lose, and you did. And a lot of NKU fans will remember that. And then on the again, you guys now get us, uh, and obviously we have that infamous game where Drew McDonald hit the buzzer beater um, to send you guys home in the semifinals. So interesting. So as, as you're talking, you mentioned the you know, the the, mo- the the Oakland Revenge Tour, and there actually was a tweet from an Oakland fan. I thought I was grabbing my phone to see if I could find it real quick. Um, Brad and I, I, I've tweeted with back and forth with Brad for years, and I don't know how to say his last name, but I want. What's to his at? Brad. What's his at? Do you have it? Yeah, his at is at Brad Demo. Okay. Um, so Brad Dem- Demattia, Demastia. I'm not sure how he, how Brad. Oh says yeah, it. I've seen that guy's name around. Yeah, Brad. Brad's a great. He's actually, you know, he's a um, Minnesota guy too. Like, but great Oakland fan. But he actually a day ago he said, "Welcome to the Oakland University Motor City Sadness Revenge Tour." Yeah. Um, Step one was to beat YSU in the Horizon League tournament because they got us in 17. That was where uh, Oakland Center uh, left left the guy alone underneath when he shouldn't have. So that's step one. Step two is going to need to be to beat NKU in their tournament for the 2019 revenge. And then step three is beating CSU in the in Cleveland State in the, the finals for a 2018 revenge. So like what happened was, in 2018? They lost to Cleveland State in the first or second round. That was the year Cleveland State beat us when they were the eight seed. Yeah, so that was the 2018. Is that right? I guess. Yeah. yeah. Yo, it was 2018. I can tell you that. I was at that effing tournament. No. So get yeah, this. this this is shaping up for a potentially an Oakland University uh, revenge tour. Yeah, that's crazy. I, so I was at that tournament when we lost to Cleveland State as the one seed. Um, absolutely dominated that year, 15 and three in conference, like incredible. We lost to Cleveland State. Uh, with Tyree Appleby and I don't even remember who else. That team was insane. Uh, I was back before my Horizon Roundtable days. I was hyper focused on NKU, so I only knew the big guys for other schools. But oh, yeah, and so anyway, I skipped the first year we went to Detroit uh, for Motor City Madden. I was just like, you know, we're the four seed, like whatever. And I'm at a wedding, uh, and I'm looking at the scores. Like, I, as it's a Catholic wedding, so it was going on for an hour and a half. And so <laughs> uh, I'm looking. I, at- I know, I know that life, man. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at the scores and I'm just seeing like, Oh my God, these teams are, these teams are losing. And I nudge my girlfriend. I try to, at the time and I try to tell her and she's like, I don't care. Shut up. It's a wedding. And I'm like, all right, well, so I turn my phone on and start watching it, but like sound all the way down. Right. And, uh, and so anyway, right. All right. So I go the next year, freaking lost in the first round. I'm like, you know what? I'm never going again. And the next year, literally the next year, Drew McDonald hits that shot. I could have been there and it was like, Oh my God. I can tell uh, you as someone that was there, it was painful. I mean, I'm as, sure. as an, I, I'm an Oakland person first, we know that, but I really have been trying hard to get away from just being an Oakland person and really cover. The you're league. always going to be, you're always going to be a little like your coverage can be neutral, but your heart is always going to be a little biased. Absolutely. And that yeah. one hurt and to have to sit there and go like, go into the presser where he had um, Cumberland with him, And I think Hill Mays, I'm um, just sitting there like, couple you know that that's two three minutes after these kids that's a ballsy that's a ballsy move bringing first of all you don't have to bring players to you after a loss or with you after a loss and then to bring cumberland yeah yeah, that's true to bring cumberland though like and i didn't ask a question because i didn't i didn't have anything to ask at that point you know like i remember just sitting there quietly in that 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 room and just letting a couple other people ask questions but the the room was silent like what 
what do you say to these kids that coach at, in that moment? Like, especially, I mean, Cumberland kind of messed up a little bit, you know, not to rehash this whole thing. He was supposed to switch. He should have already been out there and he was late. He was late to recover. It to, be, to be fair. It like as bad. I mean, not as wouldn't say as bad. I mean, he literally almost blocked that shot, but like, as you know, as minuscule as, or whatever the, 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 there was a mistake made on defense. So that given that fact, it was the perfect play offensively. You get Jalen Tate on a full head of steam. Drew McDonald got the perfect screen and yep. Jalen did exactly what he was supposed to do. He went right at Hill Mays and attacked him basically forcing Hill Mays to commit to stopping him. Like if, if, if Jalen Tate, like you, it's like, okay, it's like a wide receiver in football. Like, if you go line up and you don't run around, like you don't like go line up with energy. And like, as soon as the ball snapped, you don't like run out, like you're running a route to, and then you end up blocking a guy. They, if they can, if they can, you it, see it it's, it's all on the cell. Yeah, exactly. It's all on the cell. Like you have to sell what you're doing. And I genuinely think that if, uh, if it was Xavier, if it was Mays that was late on the switch, Tate would have shot a layup or yeah. would have shot a, a pull up. Like, there was some trust there from both of them and we just got the right look. Tate made the right play. And, and Drew McDonald is my, uh, that we, Drew McDonald's is fucking nails, dude. Like you got, you, they, NKU did what NKU does at that point. You know, I am at it. Yeah, but, exactly. That was, tough, that was a tough room to be in that day. Yeah, no doubt. Well, okay. So we touched on it a little bit, but um, so Oakland did get some revenge. Uh, nobody, nobody on this team from the year that Youngstown state beat him that's not even possible i don't think that it would have had to be like a red shirt freshman or something like that yeah so just, probably just the coaching staff but uh um yeah i mean they beat them in overtime they got them by four surprisingly an overtime four point game was the least exciting game of the night um as we already kind of touched on a little bit um what stood out to you in that game uh, uh if you had to pick like one thing what was like the one thing that really stuck out to you in that game um, biggest thing can, can I have two? They go, they go together. Pick oh, two. you can have you can have ten. I don't care. T- 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 tell me, tell um, me. Yeah, that Youngstown State came back as you know you 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 knew they were gonna get that game close. Like that wasn't gonna be a runaway game. Um, Youngstown State uh, brought the game back and had the ball. The game tied with twenty seconds left. Calls a timeout. And Oakland University, which for the long time in the league, they've been a punching bag of, oh, Oakland doesn't play defense, doesn't play, which has never been true. They just, they played a lot of possessions, all kinds of different things that have led to that. But Oakland played defense on Darius Quisenberry. They knew which way he wanted to go and they prevented him from going there. And Quisenberry couldn't get anything going and ended up just throwing up a Hail Mary from almost half court uh, to send the game to overtime. Like they had to, they had to really clamp down Youngstown State to even get that game to overtime after leading by, you know, 10, 11 points, whatever it was for a good chunk of the, the game. And a lot of the, a lot of Oakland teams in the past, I've seen it. Like I've seen a lot of heartbreak as an Oakland person and they probably, something would have happened, but they clamped down on defense and then they turned it, turned around in, in overtime and they took care of business. And I think that was actually really huge for the program because it doesn't always go that way for them. So like for Quisenberry not to hit some running layup to Akuche or, you know, something crazy like that, like that was a big moment. Yeah, no doubt. Did you say you had another one? Uh, no, it was just, I mean, overcoming the fact that why YSU made the come that made the run back and then got it, got it, got it. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if you read my uh my preview on the Oakland Youngstown State game. It was brief, but I basically laid out it was a pretty long, robust preview. I laid out basically like how Youngstown State could win this game and then how Oakland can win this game. And one of the like headings or paragraphs or whatever I had in there was, will, will the real Rashad Williams please stand up? And it, I, he's been like hit or miss all year. I know you said maybe he's been dealing with some injuries or something like that. Yeah, it's not, well, that's not even, and I mean, this is important for NKU fans to know, like he's not really Rashad right now. Uh, he got in a car accident before the season started and he needs shoulder surgery. I believe on his shooting shoulder, but don't hold me to that. I'm not positive, but yeah, he's having surgery at the end of the season. And he's at a point, um, uh, he's been all season where they said, Hey, look, it's not going to get any worse, but you're going to be in pain. So he's been playing through pain. And I think that's what you see sometimes. He's just not, I mean, he's never super consistent. He's a very streaky shooter, but he's also dealing with this, the shoulder. That's no good. And then he had an ankle injury a couple of weeks ago that I think he's good from, but you never really know, you know, what he's going through. So. Yeah, I think I mentioned in that in that article as well about the size too. Like Oakland, Oakland, they don't 
this isn't the typical Oakland team you're used to with the Twin Towers, you know, Brechting and Xavier Hill Mays, but they they have more length this year than they've than they've probably it's usually been like those two guys and then they're a pretty guard heavy team. Um obviously Cumberland last year was two years ago. I would Oh yeah, that's right. Two years ago. Jeez. I, I would I would have considered Cumberland more of like a wing. Um, but even Kendrick Nunn, like he was a little bit, I mean, he was some sort of big, but he wasn't like huge. He was always he was, more he like was a guard. guard. He was big. Yeah. Guard. Yeah. He was still, I could, I'd still call him a guard. Like I don't really call Marquez work a, a wing. I call Marquez work a guard. Right. Like, so anyway, but, but I did say that they're, they're, their size is deceptive because you're not going to look at the, at the roster and see like, you know, six, nine, six, 10, and then be like, Oh my gosh, how are we going to beat that? You, you look at the size and you probably think, oh, okay, like we can match up with that as, a, as an NKU fan. Like that's not – but they're they're deceptively big still. Like Micah uh, Parrish and Trey Townsend both play great inside. Obviously, Dan Oladapo, like we know about him as well. Um, he's fantastic. But one thing I actually just noticed is um, – tr- so Trey Townsend and Micah Parrish, first of all, I had them both on all-freshman team. Um together literally because i couldn't decide which one because their numbers are exactly the same right and i while they probably both play a little different um their numbers are very similar and so they're about at about a little over i think it's a little under nine points a game and a little under 13 or maybe a little over 13 rebounds a game it's like over 12 under 14 i know that so the decimal points can be messed up right combined so to combine those two guys went for 20 and 13 so they hit their they hit their weekend or I mean this uh, this uh, past game they hit their season averages like as freshmen they did it they did it they did what they had to do and uh, you know Oladapo just got another double double no well, big and, deal. and Townsend did one thing that for doesn't show, for anyone that didn't watch the game Townsend did one thing that doesn't show up in the box score that is ridiculous he's a he's a six six freshman that wasn't expected to even be a part of this team on any real level. And all of a sudden he was starting. Uh, He also wins almost every opening tip. It's something we can watch for. He's six, six, but he was a, he was a um, very good high school high jumper. And uh, he he will get the opening tip matters. I kind of think it's overrated. No, No, but I think it's really funny just to see him go up against like these big dudes and get up there and get it. It's been fun (laughs) for me all season. Okay. Fair um, enough. Cause I know like, I don't know if you ever noticed, but like when fans are in the, are in the stands, like they cheer when the opening tip is won. And I'm just like, okay yeah like it's such a weird it's such a weird flex but the the big thing for townsend he took six charges against ysu and i think at least three or four of those were against nas bohannon coming in at him and bohannon probably has 60 70 pounds of muscle on that kid and he just stood in there and took it That's yeah huge. yeah so i, I want to touch on that real quick i don't know uh this isn't strategic like gameplay related or anything like it's just a funny story um you you had tweeted your story about how you asked his dad about about the charges and asked if he learned it if you if uh uh Townsend had learned it from his dad right yeah and what was his dad's response again so first uh Trey's dad played for Oakland this um Trey is Campy's first like legacy uh student you know where where his dad Skip had played for him back in the day now right right um but Trey's mom also played for Oakland on the women's side oh wow yeah, so so I mean the Townsend family just has Oakland in their blood, which is part of his whole story. That's so awesome. Yeah. But uh, when I asked Skip his dad about it, he laughed. And first off, he told me, "No, I think he flopped on all of them," which he didn't. But that you know that's such a dad response. But then he told me that uh, all he gave Trey was his size. And Skip's a big man, tall and just big man. But he goes, yeah. uh, you know, "All I gave all I gave Trey was was the size. His mom, all uh, the basketball IQ and basketball skill comes from his mom." Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I bring that up because I thought it was hilarious. Like you asked that question to Campy um, on the, on the coach's show. I know you're smiling because you know exactly where I'm going with this, but he, you, uh, he responded to you and said, no, nah, I think those were all flops. And Campy was like, uh, well, he definitely learned that from his dad. Like he's the greatest flopper of all time or yeah. whatever. So I thought that, I thought that was absolutely hilarious. Um, it just kind of goes to show Campy's Campy's a funny dude. He, so he really is. yeah without a doubt. Um, and then just, just to close the book on Youngstown state real quick, I, I want to show some, some respect to some guys. I think that deserve it. Uh, Quisenberry had a, I don't know. He had a rough one. Um, I mean, his numbers look good, but they're not Quisenberry. Like he had 18 points. That's really good, but he wasn't super efficient from the field. He had five turnovers, three fouls. I, 
you look at that and you're just like, if Quisenberry had been Quisenberry, maybe, maybe the result's different. But, um, and the last two things I'll say on their players and I'll let you go is uh, Bohannon, man, triple double, like incredible, incredible. Um, just like, I'm not surprised that guy really, in my opinion, was he a first teamer? I think he ended up being on the second team, didn't he? I think he ended up second team. I thought that, I think that I, we talk a lot about, like, I was kind of upset Adrian Nelson didn't have a spot in the third team. I was really questioning the De- DeAndre Golston snub. Um, I even was kind of a little weirded out about some of the placements within first, second, third team. Like I thought maybe Vasily deserved to be second. I, th- whatever. You could get nuanced about all that stuff. I think the biggest snub is even more so than Marcus Burke is Nas Bohannon. That dude impacts the game in every possible way. And except for behind the three point line, but he doesn't need to. And like for him not to be a first teamer was to me, it was horrible, but. I was just going to say, so uh, Oakland had Youngstown in uh, for two games earlier in the season and Quisenberry Mm -hmm. was out. Um, So we, you know, Oakland had a good idea about them, but we hadn't seen um, YSU with Quisenberry yet. And even being at the game Tuesday, um, I kind of forgot about Darius Quisenberry sometimes, which is not something usual for a YSU game. You know, like he just kind of disappeared. Like his numbers, like you said, they were fine, but you kind of didn't have that usual worry. Like you usually play Darius Quisenberry and you want to know where he is every moment because the ball's in his hand and, and he's controlling the game. And I just, you could tell it, he's just, he wasn't right. And I'm sure he was battling through all the injuries that he had all year. And I think that's been the issue, but it, it, it was not a typical Darius Quisenberry game really want to see him come back. I guess that's the only silver lining is like, because he didn't have such a great year. I mean, he didn't make an all league team like mm-hmm. that. This is a guy that uh, not a lot of people, I don't think anybody actually had him, you know, wrestling player of the year, but I know a lot of people probably had him first team or yeah. in I, the running. I think I had him second, but yeah, it was like a well, close one. I, he was first team last year. Right. I mean, yeah. like no reason for him not to have been, you know, given another performance like last year, we're probably talking about Darius Quisenberry as a snub for, for player of the year. Uh, sort of like, you know, maybe should Antoine Davis have won it? Like we're bringing Quisenberry into that conversation um, if he does what he did last year. And so the silver lining there is like, maybe as a league, maybe we get him back next year. Um, but, you know, I mean, I don't know. Who knows? You never right. know. Um, and I, I I was able to ask Jared Calhoun about that. And I, I was wrong. I thought Quisenberry was a senior and I, I knew that he could come back. But I asked, I asked Calhoun in the press conference about, you know, if that was his last game, you know, do you have any thoughts about it? And he was like, you know, that it is a, he, he he could come back was was what Calhoun said. I mean, he wasn't going to speak on it or anything, but he did at least remind us that we, we might not have seen the last of Darius Quisenberry. Oh yeah. I mean, well, first of all, the, all these guys could come back. I mean, right. every single, you could be 26 and a, a senior and you could still come back for next year because of how the, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess my thing is like, where's he going to go? Uh, he would maybe transfer to a bigger, better school, something like that. But like, I, I don't know. I mean, it's going to be the most competitive transfer portal we've ever seen he tested the nba waters if you remember before the yes season. i do i do um, i do and then decided to come back you know he got what he needed from the nba side i wouldn't be surprised i mean he didn't he probably hurt his stock a little bit just with the injuries he's kind of you know forgotten a little bit i think he hurt his stock a lot so i wouldn't be surprised you know depending on you know the personal side of things which we never know you know what kids their families whatever are going through he he can go make money overseas at the very least right now and yeah I that's a good point if he that if he takes that you know at some point you go Hey, if I can make some decent money and provide for whatever I need to provide back home, like you, you take it at some point. Yeah. This is where it gets so difficult, like, and not to speculate or anything like that, but like, you just don't know what kids situations are like no. with financially. And then, I mean, also like with their home life, like, okay. So Jalen Billups uh, plays played for NKU our first year in the league. Um, yeah. he, he graduated and he's been playing overseas for four or five years now. And, uh, but he hates it. He hates going over. Well, I shouldn't say he hates going overseas, but he, there's a big, uh, trade-off. He doesn't get to see his family ever. Mm-hmm. And one thing he was like telling me about a year or two ago, like he was really excited about is, uh, he really has been pushing hard. I don't, I don't know if there's been any movement here, but he's been pushing really hard to try to get, uh, you know, another shot at the G league. He was really close at one point, something came up and, uh, he wasn't able to do it, but, he's hoping to be able to get, get it done. And, and he said, the biggest reason is like, it's a game changer with my family. Like I get to actually see my family 
like right. whenever I need to. And when you're in Australia, you know, you don't get that. And um, so for who knows, I mean, there's a plethora of things that could factor into it. I'm just saying from a skills, from a, uh, you know, just from a, being an NBA fan and just understanding kind of how some of this stuff works. Like if he wasn't on draft boards last year, he ain't going to be on draft boards this year. No way. He's exactly. a year older. Uh, yeah. He's a year older, been dealing with injuries, did not produce. And as far as transferring, it's going to be the most competitive transfer portal we've ever seen. And like 2021 recruits can't get on rosters right now because there's just who knows who's coming back. So if I'm him and fi finances aren't a huge problem, I'm coming back for another year, getting a master's and seeing what, what happens. That's exactly. what I would do. But I don't know. Anyway. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about stuff that actually matters. Um, we're not going to, we won't recap the NKU game. Uh, we're doing, we did that on uh, the last call episode. Um, so you guys can go watch that if you want, but let's talk a little bit about Matt NKU and Oakland's uh, upcoming matchup. Um, these two teams have a interesting, I don't know, short-term history, I guess you'd say uh, dating back really since we joined the conference. Um, I, I don't have numbers in front of me of like who elite owns the series or anything like that. I just remember like, there's been some really just, it's almost always a good game. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 no. Well, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I actually, uh, I didn't get to go two, three years ago. Kendrick Nunn was three years ago, right? Or was he two? I think so. three, three years ago. Yeah. Two years ago was the Drew McDonald shot. Right, right. So Kendrick Nunn came in and uh, to bb and dropped 33 on us. Like, and a big dunk at the end of the game. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they won that game, though. It was homecoming. No, he did. He, Oakland, I, I remember because Oakland fans were loving it because he was taunting your fans with a dunk at the end of the game. That's right. But you know what's crazy is like we were still fifth. So they must have gave us one of our only three losses that year then because yeah. we were fifth. Okay. So, but regardless, like, it, you know, there was that, there was uh, that, that's a very memorable game. I remember sitting at home watching that just like, we can't stop this guy. Um, then we had last year, one of the games I remember from last year was uh, at our place we had Trayvon Faulkner get a steal down the stretch the last minute right there on the baseline. I was sitting courtside for that game. So like I was right there, got to see it and it was incredible. Matt, what are your like thoughts? Like just on the NKU series in general, um, you know, what do you think when you see us on the calendar? Like, is it, is it obviously this, I don't feel like this game probably feels the same for you as it does for when you guys see, say, I don't know, young uh, Milwaukee or even like, I don't know, UIC on the calendar, you know? Yeah. I mean, so like, I'm glad that you guys have Wright state cause we have Detroit mercy. You know, that's, that's that rivalry game where like you've got that circle and it's, it's in some ways all you care about, you know what I mean? Like that mentality, but when Oakland and NKU play, you know, it's going to be a good game. It's always well coached. And I think, I feel like they're always really close. I, again, I'm not looking at numbers. I can't tell you the full, like my, I just had that, like, as I think about it, I'm like, man, I feel like these games are always just tight. Yeah. And, um, you can kind of ignore the, the first 35 minutes in a way and like, okay, let me know when there's five minutes left in the second half and I'm going to tune in because that's when it's going to start to, you know, get going. But uh, I, I look forward to it. I, I enjoy playing you guys. It's, I mean, and I'm not just saying this because I'm on your show, but like, I, I like your fan base. I like to try to keep them in their place a little bit, you know, and they like to keep me in mind and I, I appreciate that. But like, it's, it's, a, it's a good, it's a good series. It's, it's not in a, it's good because it's not the rivalry. Like if this was, was the game that we all had to get up for, it would be kind of lame, but it's like a secondary, like coming down from, from, you know, the big game that you have circled already. It's like, Oh yeah. And I still get to do this one. And that's pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. Actually, it's funny. Um, you mentioned that, uh, our history, it, it, it's five and five. <laughs> that's I'm, not where surprised. I'm looking at it right now. It's where we are. We're on a three game win streak, um, which is the largest streak in the series. Uh, your the largest margin of victory belongs to us as well. Actually, we beat you at your place the very first time we played you, which is crazy. That was the worst year of us in the league. Uh, and we were, um, we beat you guys by 17 that year. It was 2015 16. So it's the year before Kendrick Nunn, I guess, right? Was he only a one year? Year, yeah, he was for a, you guys, yeah, yeah. So I don't know that if you had a good been, team that year or not. That would have been a Kate Felder year, then I think, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, he was even better. 
I thought Kay Felder was even better than um, none. That's right. Yeah, that's that blows. But then, but then you came to our place and beat us by eleven. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna run through the whole thing. But it, it is, it's just a, it's it's, it's a, a close, really it's a good matchup. You know what I mean? Like, and that's that's why I'm excited about doing this again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. And you know what's really funny is this will be the first neutral. This will be the first neutral site matchup between the two of our teams. Technically, um, Motor City Madness was a neutral site. Technically. Oh, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Yeah. yeah so, right, but that that was it's considered a neutral site. Okay, I take it back. I take it back. They don't have Motor City Madness on here. So then you the history. Yeah, that's right. It's six to five. The history from January 19th, 2016 to February 6, 2020. So this must have been in preview of the Motor City Madness game um, is what I found. But OK, th- well, this is where it gets really funny, though, is like so obviously we're one and on neutral courts. You're oh and one on neutral courts. Um, we're, both teams are two and three at home. It's so weird. Like, yeah, it's crazy. It's you know like I said it, you know when these two teams play it's 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 gonna be close it's gonna be it's gonna be good basketball mm-hmm. you know and and I I like that that that's nice you know like it's just not gonna be something you're like flipping around like eh, what else is on because this is just it's it's not Oakland Milwaukee basketball you know like that was some of the worst basketball I've ever watched it was just just painful like I'm yeah. excited to watch you guys play you know I and what's weird is uh, we haven't seen you this year like we're meeting here in the semifinals of the conference tournament. And because y'all got COVID, we didn't get to see you when we were supposed to see you. So now it's like, oh, yeah. All right, cool. Brand new opponent. Let's let's figure this out and scout a new team all of a sudden. Ab- yeah, absolutely. And that's my that's the funny thing is like I'm a storyline guy. Like I when I when I cover sports, I like to write a story about it. Like I like to narrative it, you know, or whatever you want to call it. I like to turn it into um, you know, I, I don't know. I just I just like to I just like to create a story for it. And so for me, it's like I already said the Oakland, I, I guess someone tweeted it before me, so got beat. But um, okay. I, I, I said, I said the, the story of Oakland's tournament right now is, you know, can it be a redemption tour for them? Or is this going to be kind of same old Oakland or whatever? Um, right state, same old right state. You know, we, we, we definitely had, had, had a little bit of that. NKU, it's a kind of a lame storyline, but NKU storyline is, you know, here's this team that nobody's ever played together, right? It's, we're so young. I mean, we have three guys returning that had minutes, significant minutes last year. Paul Jokos can be the fourth if you want to count him, but he's in and out. Um, but, you know, it's a whole new thing. We're figuring, out, uh, we're figuring this all out as we go. And, oh, by the way, let's get to the tournament and give you your first two opponents you haven't seen them this year. Whereas right. everyone else is playing, got, play, playing teams they've seen. So it's just like, it's repetitive. Like, you know, we had, we already had to figure all, all, you know, ourselves out. Like we had to kind of, I don't know. I, if, if I had to slap a word on it, I guess it would just be like new. <laughs> that That's what this is. This is the year of new for NKU. And uh, one thing that Oakland's doing that really actually makes it tougher on you guys. That's something that they've never done or haven't done in 20 plus years where they're running this one, three, one zone that people are, are getting messed up by uh, especially because Parrish out top on that one, three, one, he's so long. Yeah. So with you guys not having seen that from us before, that that could potentially, you know, mess them a bit. You know, they Oakland's up there in the nation in steals because of the zone. Like they're 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 doing well with it. And Campy's even said he put it in because he had to. He was short on time because the you know Oakland had a COVID break right before the start of the season. That's why they got slapped as hard as they did by Xavier and started the season 0-9 and blah blah blah. Meanwhile, he put in this zone defense that he doesn't usually ever even think about using and it it's been really successful. Yeah. That, well, I was going to say, um, I, I can't say for sure. I'm gonna have to go back and look at it. I, but I don't think NKU's seen a one, three, one this year, or if they have it, they haven't seen one in the last two months. I can tell no. you that. So, um, that is going to be a little bit of a challenge, uh, especially obviously, like you said, with the length, one thing we love to do is we love to get our guys out in sort of like ISO situations. Um, we love running. Uh, Jim Saro says it best. I don't know if this is an actual term. I, I, I heard him say it, and it's he's dead on with what it is. It's called an Iverson screen. Basically, it's like AI. Back in the day, he'd run from the block, like up the lane, off both elbows where like two big men are setting him screens, yeah. like parallel screens at the elbows, and he gets free at the wing. And the goal is, you know, you're running your guy up the line off two 
screens, you're hope you're hoping to get a switch somewhere. And if you get AI out there matched up on a big guy, pff, curtains, yeah. right? And and uh, yeah, so we're doing that a lot with Trayvon and Marquez. Like, not it's not our primary offense, but we're running that ten times a game for you know between the two of them. And uh, you can't really do that against a one three one, especially since you're putting it out on the corner. I mean, on the wing, and teams can wrinkle in traps out of that too. Uh, so, like when the ball goes to a corner, they want you know. Sometimes they they add in a wrinkle, uh, like a trapping element. So, has it, has Oakland been doing that at all? Um, yes, this, they they they've been doing doing the trap in the corner, especially and all that. Uh, who on your team can uh, shoot the mid range jumper? Because that could be what that game comes down to. Oh, I mean, Tra- Trayvon and Marquez are two of the best mid range. Trayvon, I said, might be. I had my fair things or my fair share of criticism for Trayvon early in the year. He is probably the best mid range guard in the league. Like, it's not a it's not a high statistical shot. So like not or analytical right. shot, I should say. Like, so nobody wants to take it. Antoine Davis doesn't shoot mid range jumpers very often. Like right. Trayvon absolutely loves them. It's crazy. It's like watching like Manu Ginobili or something. Well, and that's, you know, just like with most zones, that, that center right right around the, the free throw line, that's where you got to get down into and they'll, they'll let you shoot it. They don't, they don't have a choice the way, the way that that zone works. So if, if, you, yeah. if someone gets going from there. That, that, the, har- the hardest part about the one, three, one is like, you want to break it by obviously getting the ball. Like you want to rotate them enough to where you can sink the ball into the middle and then the, the zone just kind of collapses on the middle and then everything opens up the kick out for three, the baseline specifically, but like you have to have a great decision maker in the middle. So like what, what was so good for NKU, like every time a team zoned us two, two, three years ago. And I was just like on the edge of my seat. I didn't even care. Like, it, you know, the, the old adage is like, Hey, you know, shoot your way out of a zone or whatever, like beat a zone. I should no way, dude. I used to love watching Drew McDonald operate the middle of a sure. zone offense because he's the most cerebral player like I've ever watched at NKU. And he'll get the ball and everything's an option. We'd had we we loved running like Chris Vote on the baseline. And so you get that high low action with that's a future NBA star Chris Vote, right? Uh yeah, future NBA star Chris Vote, trademark Bahal Vanguard. Right. Um <laughs> Uh, yeah. So you get, you get one of the best passing big men, like of his era, the ball in the paint and you get a seven footer, a future NBA seven footer running that baseline. And Trayvon would run the baseline too. Like, you know, we had sharp who could shoot. We had, uh, I don't know, LaVon Holland that year could shoot. So, yeah, I mean, we don't, I don't know. It's going to be tough. I don't know what we have this year, but I'm, I'm usually pretty pessimistic on nku before the game and then pretty optimistic afterwards so yeah that's a, that's a way to operate yeah for sure hey you know what i can't let you i can't let us get through an entire podcast without asking you about this um we didn't talk about jalen moore or uh we talked about rashad we didn't talk about jalen moore we did not talk about oladapo we did not talk about zion young i feel like those are kind of like some key players that we need to at least hear their names so yeah. And then, I mean, I guess we can talk about Lampman if you want. Nope. And, and maybe he Kangu. Has, honestly, he hasn't even been playing. Okay. Uh, All right. Lamp, Lampman, Lampman, yeah, he's, I mean, he hasn't been playing. Um, Kangu has been playing uh, a lot. But in the YSU game, he made two early mistakes and never saw the floor again. Okay. Wow. So, you know, but you'll see him. Uh, Jalen Moore um, is probably the best point guard in the league at this point. Um, and he's fast. And if – so is Jalen Moore a point guard? Does he run the point for y'all? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, because Moore... Rashad Rashad was your point guard last year. No, but yes, but not really. Uh, you Kangu, didn't really have. Did you not Kangu, have one? I guess. No, that was part of the problem last year. Is Oakland didn't have a point guard. Okay, got it. Got when, it. When Norris transferred to Loyola Chicago out of nowhere, all of a sudden they were left without a point guard. It was a whole mess. So that's why they went out and got Jalen Moore from the JUCO ranks. Um, he was a third team All JUCO um, point guard. And should be probably playing at the high major level, but he's, I think he's listed at 5'10, which tells you that he's probably even shorter than that. I think he's probably listed at 175 pounds, which tells you he's probably less than that. Um, but he can shoot, he can pass, uh, he passes so well. Um, he's, he's fast. Um, there's a reason he was a first teamer and will probably be in the discussion for Horizon League Player of the Year in the future. Yeah, I mean, he's, NKU fans got to know about this guy. He's so smooth too. Like he's got, he, 
I don't know. This is a really bad comparison and it's not like, it's a good comparison from a skill set perspective. So stick with me on it, but it's a bad comparison just because like, you don't really want your name associated with this guy right now, <laughs> but he's got a lot of like Delonte West vibes to his game. Like, and I, I say that because he's like lefty and stuff, but I mean, he's just like, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I felt like well, Delonte West was always very smooth in college and like, Go ahead, though. One, one, one of the, the biggest reasons Oakland was able to land him out of a whole lot of other teams, including um, he was so close to signing with Purdue Fort Wayne and then last second went to Oakland, but that's a different story. Um, is a, he's an undersized, undersized lefty point guard. When has Oakland had one of those before in the past? Kay Felder. He, he's real aware of Kay Felder, and, and he's, he's, he's working within that model at Oakland. And that was a big part of the recruiting pitch to, to get him was, hey, You've seen that we can get a we, what we can do with someone like you. Uh, Case Elder was a bit stronger, uh, more still adjusting to the size of uh, NCAA Division One, but what you can essentially look for this will be telling how this game plays out is how they officiate this game. If they're gonna put if they're gonna call a lot of fouls and let more get to the line, you guys are done. If they let them play through contact, probably gonna win. For Northern Kentucky will probably win. Like. More shoots, more free throws than anyone in the nation. But when they're not calling it, he, he just gets knocked around. And, is, you know, he, he getting to the line is important to him. So that's yeah. something to keep an eye on in this game. Well, the good news is it's Horizon League uh, basketball. So it could be called very physical uh, for five no, minutes. No. And then, yeah, I mean, who the, who the hell knows? Like loud and love. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and cry in my Cheerios that Wright State is not in the tournament anymore. But loud and love got – some of the worst foul. Like I went back and I just got done watching that entire game today, uh, recording it and all that. So I can hope maybe make a video out of it. But uh, that dude got some horrible calls against him. Like yeah. I would be like, not as bad as the Bryson Langdon foul that I shared, by the way. Okay. But I mean, that was, do you saw that? Like yeah, that I'm was, happy. what the hell? Like Waterman pushed off Trayvon Faulkner in the back. And then he goes and just tackles Bryce. I don't know what the ref was doing there. It's almost like he blew the whistle, pointed one way on accident. Like he didn't mean to do it. And then he's just like, oh, shit. Just, oh, fuck, I can't do it now. Like I'm going to get tweeted about. All right. You know, it's like, dude, just correct yourself. And then you wouldn't be on Twitter. I'll tell you what, I've, I've watched enough Detroit Mercy. And this is very unrelated. Uh, it's something to talk about another day or to keep in the back of our minds. Waterman's dirty. I've seen a lot of chippy moves out of that dude. And uh, dude, I don't trust, I don't trust any, I don't trust any white kid with a man bun. Like I was a white kid with a man, bun. I'm not going to lie to you for, for a couple of years. So I, I, well, I would I let it go. Yeah. First, well, I'm not, look, I'm not saying that every white kid with a man bun is bad. I'm just saying that like it's a 50, 50 split. So that I don't like those odds. Like those, like if He's dirty, you know, when we're talking about, when we're talking about like a look, uh, and you're and you're segmenting beat people's personality based on how they look that's probably one that's got to be one of the higher percentages of like shitheads like you know you're I will about, that i am as your fans know i would fall in that category yeah 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 okay so let's talk about that real quick we'll close we'll close out with that um i should have led with this but i wanted to you know no one ever makes it to the 40th minute on this so we'll that's too uh because they're gonna want to hear this part i know i it. know so as you guys know i i I'm not trying to get into like a history, a historic thing here or anything like that, but I will just say, generally speaking, I think it's fair to say that Matt has always been uh, the least bullish on NKU out of anybody around the league, whatever you want to take with that. Um, anyone who can consider themselves semi, somewhat, somewhat nonpartisan uh, out of all those people, Matt has always been like, basically it's always felt like okay this is the year the, that nk is finally not going to be good and yeah. he, he he really really stuck that home this year as he picked nku to finish oh you know a lot of people had nku finishing sixth some people had him finishing seventh some people had him finishing eighth i mean it's a completely new team everything like that matt didn't say matt was lower than that he wasn't he sat you know he didn't go with eighth he can go with ninth. Don't. He can go with tenth. He thought the NKU was going to be the second worst team in the conference. I did. And we are now within a game of being the second best team in the conference. Um, unless, of course, we lose. 
and then you put an asterisk on the season and it doesn't count. So Matt, it's time to atone for and your I transgressions. Watched, you know, for, for about a month and a half, if you're listening to Rise on Roundtable, where I am pretty much every week in some of my writing, I have said it, but I'll say it on your on yours as well for your fans. I was wrong. Mia Copa, my bad. NKU, I you know, looking at it and looking at the, you know what you guys lost losing uh, Tate to Arkansas, right? Like yeah. All that, like yep. looking at it, looking with the, you know, you know, your coach, uh, you know, second year. Okay. You know, sometimes players stick around for that first year to see what's going on and then take off as we're seeing with the green Bay right now. Like I thought things were, I thought the wheels were going to fall off for a minute. I didn't, I wouldn't have said that. I think it's going to be this way forever. And you guys are about to be bottom feeders forever, but I thought this was going to be a rebuild for you guys. And instead you guys, your, your team has done a hell of a job to be right there. I also have to say, not only did I have you guys 11th, that meant there was one team that could be worse in my opinion, my preseason thoughts, than Northern Kentucky. And I had that as Milwaukee. So two of the last four teams standing, I had in my bottom two. So as we all know, if you've ever listened to me talk, read anything I wrote, I'd have no idea what I'm talking about and just ignore me. It's fine. I understand. Yeah. So I would give you some advice, Matt, and that is just to a, I mean, continue. If this is how you want to go, just continue. Like you don't give a shit what people think. I think that's the best way to go. But if, but, but if, you know, if you tend to care about things like, I don't know, your integrity or self-respect. I'm on horizon round table. What integrity anything, <laughs> anything like that. Um, hey, horizon round table credentialed by the horizon league. So you better that's chill good. out on that. Um, so, uh, no, if you care about any of these things, I mean, even if you just care about how, like what people think about you and if they respect you, do what I do. Just fall off the face of the earth at the beginning of the season. Don't answer DMs and don't even put your preseason picks in because then you can come back and Monday morning quarterback it with me in March. Because <laughs> okay. I, I will always put it out there and I'm willing to say I'm right and I'm willing to say I'm wrong. And on Northern Kentucky this year, I was wrong. And it's just going to be fitting that you guys are going to knock Oakland out of the tournament to put a big exclamation point on the how wrong I was factor. Fair enough. Fair enough. To be fair, to be fair, because that's what we like to do here. Matt had us 11th. Um, We were three and five at one point coming off a two game sweep, getting swept, I should say, by two uh, in two games by IUPUI at home. So I look, I don't know. I mean, if we had played Oakland, those two games, we canceled them and maybe lost those two games and the wheels were really going to start falling off. Maybe we don't recover. So uh, it just so it goes to show like, it, you know, obviously we ended up doing way better, but we got hot. You know, we won eight of our last 10 and, uh, and that kind of saved us from the basement. We were like ninth after we lost to IUPUI. So the, the last thing, and then I'll let you close this out. I'm, I know that you're, you're sick of hearing from me. The, the thing, the biggest thing I didn't account for and I, I should have listened to you guys, but you know, sometimes when, when you're reporting on your own, you're it's, you got to try to weed through like how much of it is hype and how much of it is real is I didn't believe how good work was going to be. I didn't I, believe. It. I don't, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care what anybody says. Everyone's going to Monday morning quarterback this. And I'm like, I'm not even going to Monday morning quarterback this. I, I knew work was going to be good. I did not know he was going to be freshman of the year. I don't think anybody, you can never make that prediction. That's ridiculous. So anyone who tries to say like, I knew this kid, like, dude, I went and watched him play in high school. Like me and Troy Corns met up in Lexington, watched this kid beat the number two team in the state. And we both looked at each other and said, this kid's legit. But like, I had concerns. I didn't see him shoot very many threes that game. I didn't see him. Um, I, I did not, I didn't see him, t- you know, uh, well, I guess I saw him drive to the basket a lot and take contact, but that's from high schoolers. Like, I don't know. Right. He's a small kid. Like, I, so yeah, I, Warwick, Warwick was a huge, pleasant surprise. I would say for me, like, I mean, I had NKU six, but like, that's because I'm an NKU fan. If I was being realistic. I would have said, I would have said, like, I was saying basically to other NKU fans, expect a down year. I don't see us being better than fourth, but don't be surprised. Like, I basically was saying, take six or better or higher as a win. Like that's a win this year. And so what I'm, what I mean by that is I didn't deny that we could fall below six. And like, I didn't expect Bryson Langdon to increase his production scoring the basketball. I didn't know he was capable of doing it. Adrian Nelson, most efficient rebounder in the conference at six, seven, like, and I say most efficient, like he doesn't get the most boards, but he's got the highest offensive rebound percentage. And so like, you know, 
him and Oladapo obviously have a, a stake in, in the in the rebounding king title. In fact, that's another little storyline we can focus on when we watch the game. But I guess the point is like even NKU fans, most of them did not expect this um, this year. So. Yeah. You guys, honestly, there's a lot of correlations between the way you guys have been in the Horizon League and Oakland. Oakland has never been in the bottom half of the league since they joined this league either. And there's been a lot of years that they've been expected to be. Did they finish strong? Did they finish strong last year? I thought they were I thought they were bottom half last year, but I don't believe so. I think they were fifth or sixth, something like that. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I'll have to, I'll have to double again. I'm I apologize if I'm wrong, but no, that's no, that's okay. But that, that would be an anomaly. I mean, NKU, NKU, I could say NKU's never finished bottom half of the league, but they were five and 13 their first year, but that's their first year. So like, er, right. er, you know, everyone's got that one year too. So but Oakland did, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's fair that. enough. Well, all right, man, let's, I guess before, before we sign off, I need to get a prediction. Um, you can go down to score if you want, or you can just give me straight up win loss, however you want to do it. So here's how I'm going to do this. And uh, luckily by this point, most of the Oakland people aren't listening, so they can't come at me. Oakland has a tendency to win the first round, first game of the tournament that they play in and lose the second one. And I don't know that they buck that tradition. So I'm going to say NKU by seven. Cool. Um, you're right. Probably that Oakland people have probably tuned out a long time ago. Um, at this point, I am still going to clip this and this is going to make Twitter as a highlight. So okay. don't worry about, don't worry about them not seeing it. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, okay. So I have, we talk about integrity, right. And what people think about you, stuff like that. I had Oakland winning it all. I did. I genuinely did. And a lot of it was an emotional pick. I just wanted them to get to the final because it meant it was an easier path for NKU and then we'd meet and then who knows. And I just picked Oakland cause I didn't want to pick NKU. But so on the one hand, I like, I can't double, I can't fall back on my pick. But on the other hand, it's like I, I do have some plausible deniability because like we're not meeting in the championship, and I picked Oakland to beat us in the championship. Yeah, the championship's totally different than the, the semifinal here. I know. I, it's the late game. It's nine thirty. No, I I gotta stick with it. Um, mostly because I'd rather be I'd rather be wrong and happy and elated than correct and disappointed you know this is like when you bet on the other team against your team so you're gonna make money or you're gonna be happy i see what you're doing exactly so i am gonna i'm gonna head i'm gonna double down on my oakland pick um i think that the 131 gives us some problems uh i think that i think that oakland is a much much better rebounding team than uh detroit mercy is uh detroit mercy is probably the worst rebounding team i've ever seen um primarily because they shoot so well, they don't need to rebound as much, but they really just do not, they just are not very well. I don't know if it's, they just don't have the skill or they're not coached well in that regard. I don't know. That's not what they're built to do. Yeah, it, it was bad. We really exploited that. We're not going to get that with Oakland. So we're going to have to be a lot more effective on the first few, on the first shot we get. And it's going to be very difficult to do that in a one, three, one against that length. So I actually have that being the difference. I'll say um, games have been trending well, the, the regular the regulation games anyway, have been trending more like in the seventies. I was, I had NKU beating Detroit mercy, 72, 65. I was off by only a little bit of 70, 69. So I'm going to go Oakland. I'll do the same score that I did for Detroit mercy and NKU, but I'll flip it and say, say, uh, actually I'll do 72, 68, 72, 68, Oakland. I'll go with that. Yeah. Look at that. I, I predict NKU, you pick, you pick Oakland. Worlds are colliding. I think we're both, I think we're both just like, like really jaded. That's what it is. <laughs> like I said, I've seen Oakland lose in the second round after winning the first round of whatever, you know, first, second round, however that plays out. The second game they play in the tournament, they've never made it to the Horizon League finals. That's what it yeah. about to, so. And my thing is, I like I said, I don't give a shit if anyone cares about my predictions because they always suck. I'm more of like a right about what's happening on the court kind of guy. So I'll predict whatever the hell I want and then just say, yep, I was wrong. Sorry. I just talk. <laughs> so People yep. keep asking me to talk. It's weird. I like it though. All right, Matt, tell me uh, tell me where people can find you and then let's get out of here. All right. Uh, on Twitter at Horizon Matt. Uh, that's me uh follow the podcast at horizon rt we appreciate it please listen to us we, we really try our best to cover everybody except for one school that doesn't want to take care of us because we're credentialed at 11 yeah. uic come on uic send us some writers we need some writers oh no, you're talking about no, someone that's not that's not the one kyle <laughs> yeah i know we all know the story um 
but you know what? I'm going to get to talk to Darren Horn for the first time in 12 months. Uh, hopefully it's after a win, but if it's after a loss, I'm still going to ask him a question. I don't know what the hell it's going to be, but we'll see. Make sure, make yourself seen my friend. We're happy to have yeah. you. That's right. All right, man. Um, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Talk, I guess next year. Hey Kyle, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right. Peace out. Take care.